Amen. Well, thank you, David. Uh, great to be back with you all. I think the last time I was in this room was a uh, 50-year anniversary. That's right. Uh, That's right. I believe that was last year. So great to be back with you all. Uh, good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, Cammie and Evie send their regards. Uh, I was telling a few folks, uh, Evie is wonderful, love her to death, um, but this is not the type of event where she excels. Uh, <laughs> she, she prefers a big open field, uh, maybe a playground or two, and somewhere she can scream a little bit. And so uh, they are back at home, uh, but they miss you all as well. Um, so I, we're just going to kind of go through. I've got a PowerPoint presentation. Um, David told me to stay to about 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, you know me well enough. I'll do my best. Um, uh, but no, I, I will honor your time. Um, so I don't know if we've got those slides. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know where to go without them. Um, what I've got on the first one, and the reason I really want it for you is because it's got a picture of Evie. If we'll go to the next one, I believe it does. Oh, so there we go. Yes, yes, yes. You can now go home. You've gotten to see the one thing you came to see. Um, you, most of you probably know me already, but I, I like to share just who I am and kind of what I'm doing. I've had the privilege the past 18 years or 18 months to serve as the senior pastor at Sam Jones Methodist Church there in my hometown of Cartersville. Uh, I am now an ordained elder in the Global Methodist Church, uh, and in full disclosure, I'm a part of the executive leadership team for the North Georgia District of the Global Methodist Church, which will ultimately become uh, the North Georgia Conference of the Global Methodist Church. Uh, you can see here my wonderful wife, Cammie, on the left in the smaller picture. This was actually our first Sunday at Sam Jones. Uh, was able to baptize her there. And then this is her. So she was probably three months old or so in that picture. And then this picture on the right was taken uh, maybe two months or so ago. My wife just is appalled that I choose that picture because she's kind of got an uh, awkward smile on her face. But I just, uh, I, I just love it. Uh, it's wonderful. I also put on there uh, that I'm a lifelong Methodist. And uh, some of you know my story. I've shared it when I was serving here. Um, I, I grew up United Methodist. And so we're going to use that term some today, uh, not to speak ill of anybody, right? But it's part of our history, part of our heritage, part of my life, right? And it's impossible to tell my story without using those words. So I grew up a United Methodist, assumed I would serve in a United Methodist church uh, my entire life. I'm fortunate. Um, my dad grew up Church of God, and my mother grew up Methodist, and United Methodist in particular. And so when they got married, as often happens, they decided, well, we've got to figure out a church to go to. And so they sat down and compromised, and I'm learning this the more I'm married. They compromised and said, well, then we'll go to a United Methodist church. Uh, my dad made the right decision there. And I'm fortunate. I I'm very fortunate. I'm thankful that I was able to be raised up and serve within the Wesleyan Methodist tradition. I, I believe that it is the best expression of God's grand picture of faith lived out in the church. Um, there are wonderful denominations out there. I know folks in many of them. I've got family and other things outside of the Methodist tradition. But for me, it is rich and, and impactful in my own faith journey to consider myself a Methodist. And so I come at this from the same perspective that you do, um, that, that this is a part of who I am and I, I care about it deeply. Um, so you'll see on the next slide, a lot of folks may ask, um, you know, why am I here? What I don't want you to think is that I'm here to be a salesperson. I promise that I'm not. And I hope that you will receive that genuinely because we have a, a connection far beyond today. Um, I'm one voice, one perspective, one person's opinions on this matter. I, I told David as we were talking about um, you know, me coming, I said, look, my, my goal in, in coming, I hope this is what you would want from me, is not to come and sell you on the GMC. Um, I'm going to talk about the Global Methodist Church and why I'm excited to be a part of it, but that's just my perspective. I want to give you a winsome vision for it, but I don't want you to feel as if when you walk out of here today, you've got a sales pitch from someone that wants to come and convince you to do something. Um, if you ultimately believe that the Global Methodist Church is the best place for Due West to be, I will celebrate that with you. If you decide something else is the best option for Due West Methodist Church, I will celebrate that with you. Um, I can especially say it to you all that I love this church no matter what, right? Global Methodists or not. And so I hope to share some things with you, um, but, but know that I'm not here 
and if you don't choose to be Global Methodist, I'll never show up again. Uh, that's, that's certainly not true. Uh, we love this place, uh, and we're thankful for you. Uh, we'll go to the next one. So the mission of the Global Methodist Church. In fact, our church, we just spent the month of January kind of diving into this mission statement. So I, I've really come to love it. Um, so the mission of the Global Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. Um, Making disciples of Jesus Christ it is the reason that the church exists. The church is unique in a lot of ways. It is a multiplying organization. And I don't even love using that word, but, but I'll use it here. It's a multiplying body. The church exists primarily for those that aren't even in it yet. It makes the church so vastly different than any other body, organization, or entity that you will be a part of. But it's what makes it unique and why I think God has called us to the work of the church. So we're called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And what I love about the rest of this mission statement is, is we want to make dynamic disciples. Uh, we, we don't want people who are mundane and in the rut of faith. Um, we, some of you, I, well actually I know it because I know Bronwyn when, when, when I was here, she loved The Chosen. Um, uh, we've started getting into The Chosen recently too. We were kind of behind on the times. Um, there's this scene where Jesus is talking with Matthew, his disciple. They're working on the Sermon on the Mount. And I won't get into all the details there, but he's talking about his, his sermon. And, and he talks about this part, the, the salt of the earth. This, uh, at that point in the sermon, in the story, uh, that was the beginning of Jesus' sermon. And Matthew doesn't quite understand what he's saying. And, and eventually Jesus gets to the point and he says, Look, Matthew, I, I don't want to just spell it out because what I want are followers who will pay attention. I want followers who will dive deep into these words. And he says these words. I don't want passive followers. Um, and that's why I love this mission statement, because what it describes for us is a church that's not seeking to create passive followers of Jesus Christ. We want to be making disciples of Jesus Christ who do these things, who are dynamic, who worship passionately, not just on Sunday mornings, but in every aspect of their lives, who love extravagantly, that extravagant means to go above and beyond, right? We want to be a people that are being ourselves and making disciples who are loving others extravagantly and then witnessing boldly. Um, that's something that we've missed in the past 20 or so years. Of what it means for us as disciples to go out and witness to our faith and to do that boldly wherever we find ourselves. And so this is the vision, our mission for what the Global Methodist Church desires to be. Um, we also have some key ministry commitments. I think that's what's next on our slide. No, I'm going to tell you about the GMC today before I tell you about our key ministry commitments. That's all right, too. Um, so, because a lot of folks ask, and it's true, right, what is the Global Methodist Church? It's a relatively new organization, relatively new denomination. It started in May of 2022, and there's history there that we don't have to get into, but it came out of the uh, kind of split from the United Methodist Church. So as of today, and, and these numbers are slightly off because they change every day, um, there's almost 4,500 local congregations that are spread all across the world, Africa, Europe, Philippines, the United States. There's roughly the same amount, about 4,500 pastors who have been received and accepted into the, or into the Global Methodist Church. There's 19 annual conferences, and again, all of these numbers continue to grow as more folks uh, disaffiliate or as there are new congregations that are started. There's several uh, new congregations that have been started within the North Georgia area within the past year. Um, in our area, you can kind of see, I've given you two numbers here. There's 142 churches in South Georgia. And again, these numbers may be slightly off. As of today, North Georgia is currently still a part of South Georgia. That will change soon. And if you have questions about why that is, I can get into those. Uh, to, to be brief about it, because of the pause that was put on North Georgia churches, uh, it, it took us a little bit longer to get a conference together. Uh, the GMC has asked that, churches, or that conferences be viable, and they have said that that's about 85 to 100 churches where they see a conference as viable. So it, it took North Georgia a minute longer to get there. So to get around that or to help North Georgia be birthed, South Georgia allowed us, with the uh, permission of the TLC, to be a district of South Georgia. So North Georgia is currently a district, but will become a conference here soon. So we have, you can see, go back just one more, sorry about that. Uh, we have 104 churches approved in North Georgia. And I know for a fact that number's wrong because I get emails every week about new churches that have applied and have been approved. And so I have not done the math, but that number has gone up 
probably five to ten churches since I last updated this slide. Uh, so churches are joining every week. I mean, literally, the leadership team gets an email every week, and we vote on these churches to approve. So that is growing. If you go to our website, ngagmc.org, you'll find a Find a Church tab. Uh, that is, we're trying with our website developer to get, keep that as updated as possible. You'll find, I think, 84 of those 104 are already on there and we're working on getting the new ones added, and we, we're working on that every week. So uh, it, it's dynamic, it's changing all of the times. Uh, it's exciting, uh, but it's a lot of work. But uh, that's, that's what God means when he doesn't want passive followers. Uh, it comes with a lot of work. So uh, we'll go to the next slide as well. So I wanted to talk about some of these key ministry commitments, uh, things that the Global Methodist Church value and, and are committed to ensuring are a part of this new denomination. Uh, these first two, for me, are, are some of the reasons I'm most excited about the Global Methodist Church. They are committed, we are committed, to empowering local churches to be the main place and to be seen as the main place where disciple-making happens, where people and lives are impacted. Um, there is nothing more important within the life of a denomination than a local church. Um, somewhere along the way, other traditions, we, we've inverted that, right? Where we began to see conference initiatives and conference boards and committees as more important and the churches as the ways in which we fund those initiatives. Um, the GMC is committed to flipping that back to how I believe it should be seeing the local church as the center of disciple-making, empowering the local church to be a part of the decision-making processes, and to never allow what the conference does to become more important than what the local church does. Uh, the conference should exist for the purpose of supporting local churches, never the other way around, right? And so the GMC is committed to that, and you'll see there, local church as evangelistic and missional center. I've been a part of a lot of conference things, and I'm very thankful to God for that opportunity. It's changed my life, but I'll be honest, and I won't say never, right? I, I, I have never, somebody may have, I've never seen a life change for Jesus Christ sitting in a meeting for a conference. That doesn't mean it's not important, but where lives are changed are in rooms like this, and the GMC is committed to ensuring that that is where the focus is. Um, nimbleness is, is drastically important in my opinion. Uh, we serve in a changing world. Um, it changes every day, uh, sometimes every hour, right? Uh, when I first got here, we were in the time of COVID. Um, I know it's still around, but we were still masking, and um, we don't have to go back to those dark days. But right, the, the world changes all of the time. Uh, with the internet and all of technology that's come with it, we, we live in a changing world. And, and so we need to be nimble what that doesn't mean is we need to be changing, right? We don't need to be changing our theology. We don't need to be changing what we believe. But what it does mean is we need to be committed to ensuring that the church is able to reach the people that are around us. That's a deeply Wesleyan core value. That You look at the life of John Wesley, who often went outside of the parish and went to the place where the people were to preach the gospel. And so the GMC is committed to nimbleness, uh, it is committed to not creating structure. See, the way that you do this is you don't create structure that doesn't allow for churches to be able to, to come up with creative ministries. Uh, it, it's tied into having the local churches, the evangelistic and missional center. We have to be nimble. We have to not create organizations that require so much maintenance that we're not able to do the great work of the church. Um, so the GMC is, is committed to that. Um, GMC is committed to global, multicultural, and multi-ethnic ministries. Uh, that's a big part for me. I know it's right there in the name, Global Methodist Church. Um, but more than just the name, I believe that, that God has called us to that work of being in connection with folks across the world. Um, I, I, again, I've told you, and, and most of you know this about me, I've had the opportunity to go and be a part of meetings and um, Africa and, and meet folks from the Philippines and, and Europe. And, and my faith has been nourished and strengthened because of what I have come to learn from them. I'll still remember always, uh, probably to the day I die, uh, we were in Zimbabwe. 
and we were at, at, at this hotel, and uh, it was probably one of the last days that we were there, and so we were having a worship service with some folks that were there from Zimbabwe, and we came to the time to take up the offering, and, you know, I'm, I'm from Georgia, and uh, Churches much like Due West, right? When it's time for the offering, we don't say much. The ushers come and pick it up. We pass the plates. Uh, usually, I know especially here, we've got a beautiful offering song, right? Something along those lines. In Zimbabwe, they do something a little bit different, and it really messed up this uh, Georgia boy's perspective. Uh, we, you know, we, we started taking up an offering. There was no ushers. The music started to play. The dancers began. And, and what you found were the leaders of the church. You started with the bishops, and then the pastors would go. Uh, it's just a cultural thing for them. But what they would do, and I'm not going to do it because I, I was told this is recorded, they would dance up to the plates, right? They did a little dance, and they would lay their offering into the plates. And, and that changed for me my viewpoint on giving. I have not instituted that. Um, I, you know, maybe consider it, right? Uh, see how that, t- please tell me how it goes first, and then I, I may try it. Um, but, but I learned something from my African brothers and sisters in faith for that day that I had never seen before. And, and so that's what we mean by being global, multicultural, and multi-ethnic. That we have something to learn from those across the world. Um, we haven't gotten it all figured out here in the U.S. Um, we've got some things we could share with the world, but the world has some things to share with us. And so we're committed to, to doing that. There's lots of ways that we're committed. One is it is a church all across the world. You saw the annual conferences that are represented there. Another way that the Global Methodist Church is committed to this is um, they're asking for conferences to partner together, to, to really have a brother and sister relationship. So what they're asking is for a conference in the U.S. and a conference outside of the U.S. to partner in ministry to walk alongside one another, to, to maintain a, a regular relationship for the purposes of not sharing resources, though that will happen from time to time, but that's not the, the key reason. The key reason is to share mission and ministry together and to learn from one another. And so there's lots of ways that the GMC is committed to that. Same with long-term enduring global missional partnerships. Same concept, um, this meaning mission organizations across the world. I'm going to share a little bit more about that one in a later slide, um, but to me that's a huge thing. And then obviously a key ministry commitment of living out the Great Commission, um, right? It goes into that mission statement that the reason we are here, the reason you are here, the reason God has called you to be a part of the body of Christ is so that we can go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is what the church should exist for A denomination should exist to empower local churches and local people like you to be a part of that. And the Global Methodist Church is is committed to that. We'll go to the next slide. So I I know it's a question, and and so I'm going to try my best to to give some some reasons, and even a little later I'm going to answer maybe some specific questions. Um, But why why the GMC? And, And particularly, maybe you're even asking, right, why join anything? Um... That was a question that, that we at Sam Jones had to answer, right? Uh, we, we went through much of what you're going through now as we tried to think through what our future would look like. Why join and be a part of anything if what we're doing is good? Um, there's lots of answers that I could give there. And um, specifically from, from my perspective, uh, you know, to be a part of the Wesleyan movement, to be a part of the Methodist tradition is to share in connection with other people. Um, I, I think you probably would agree with this because you're a part of a church. My faith is strengthened as a result of being around other people. Um, I am a better follower of Jesus Christ when I'm in community with other folks, when I do life with them, when we pray together, when we read scriptures together. It's really hard to do that on my own. And, and I'm a firm believer that what's true for me as an individual is true for the church. Um, you, you can do it, I guess. It's just it, it's better and, and more full when you do it with other folks. Um, that has been true for the Methodist tradition since the time of John Wesley, and I still believe it's true today. We've always been connectional. Not institutional. I think that put up, uh, I put that up there, right? There's a difference between being connectional and institutional. It's a matter of where your priorities and your allegiances lie, right? But we have always been a connectional people where we have looked and, and taken seriously those scriptures that say, don't give up meeting together, right? But hold one another accountable in love. That's a, a core value 
of Methodism. Um, and I think if Due West wants to continue in that Methodist tradition, that considering joining something, and, and in my opinion, the GMC is the best option, but, but joining something is a deep part of continuing those, those Wesleyan roots and that Wesleyan tradition. We'll go to the next. So why GMC? Because a connectional and shared understanding of what it means to be a Wesleyan Christian. Um, and I don't want to understate the importance of this. Again, I can pull from my uh, you know, real-life experience going through the same process that you're going through at Sam Jones. A big question for us and a big topic of conversation was what happens when everybody in this room is not here? Um, I've been with many of you. I know who you are. This is a great church with a lot of great leaders, some great pastors. you got an even better associate pastor now than, than you did a few years ago, right? Um, this is a great church. I have no doubt that if Due West Methodist Church decided, hey, we're, we're doing okay, but we're going to stay who we are, and we're going to charge forward. I have no doubt that you would be fine, that you would continue on in mission and ministry, that you would do the work of Jesus Christ here in the community. I, I'm not concerned about that at all. Um, but what happens when you're gone? Um, what happens when folks that aren't committed to the same values are all of a sudden in the pews? Um, what happens when folks who aren't from the Wesleyan tradition decide that they want to make Due West their home? Again, it's not to say we don't welcome folks into the doors, right? Anybody's welcome to come and participate. But joining into something like the Global Methodist Church provides a core and foundational doctrine that's Wesleyan through and through that maintains those things you value long after you are no longer here. Uh, we, we always said, we want to be a church that is not the same as today when I use that language, but that's teaching the same core values today as it will in 150 years. Um, again, we've got to be nimble because the world changes, but that core Wesleyan value, the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't. And so joining into a denomination provides those theological guardrails that says, hey, we believe this to be true, and we want to be a part of a system that helps maintain these beliefs. Um, that's vitally vitally important uh, to maintain. Again, not in the next five to ten years, but in the next 50 to 100, right? That's what being a part of the Global Methodist Church does. And it also connects you to other people um, because theological discussions are best among people, right? And so the best way to not be siloed is to, to have that connection to other Wesleyan churches so that we can continue to grow in our own spiritual relationship as a church as well. Um, I, I think you have to be a part of something uh, to maintain that teaching of doctrine. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go to the next one. So there's also, when you get into the Global Methodist Church, I know you love both of your pastors, but there will become a day um, when one of them either retires or one of them has to move on. Um, right, things change. Um, that, that's a part of the life of every church. And so what the Global Methodist Church provides is a vetted method of deploying pastors and a vetted pool of clergy that are available when it's time to have a pastoral transition. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what a pastoral transition might look like, when those would happen, Do West's role in that. But being a part of the Global Methodist Church gives you resources when it comes to pastoral transitions that you would not have as an independent congregation. It gives you a vetted method to vet those, and then it also gives you a, a, a qualified clergy pool of folks that you know, just like we talked about a second ago, that are committed to those Wesleyan Methodist core doctrines that you are committed to. Uh, it's an important part of joining a denomination. I will go to our next one. And then this is very similar, but it's really for the clergy side of it. And I can speak to you as a clergy person. Uh, I won't speak on behalf of David, but I know that he would agree with this. That one of the reasons to join something is so that your clergy has some accountability. They're, they're accountable to the local church, but clergy need to be accountable to one another. I'm a firm believer that everybody in life should have someone that they sit under, right? That you should have somebody to whom you have to answer. Ultimately, we all have to answer to Christ, right? But every single person, because we're human, needs someone that's in them over authority. David needs that, Sam needs that, and whomever is your pastor at any point in time needs that. And so what the GMC offers is accountability. Now that doesn't always look like discipline and punishment, 
right? We've come to use that term to just simply meaning keeping someone in line. But what this also provides is a network of clergy for your clergy person to be a part of, uh, to bounce ideas off of, to uh, have conversation with. Um, This provides your clergy person with accountability that will make them a better pastor for you. Um, That doesn't mean you can't find that elsewhere. Uh, David's been around a long enough time. You know a lot of clergy, I'm sure. That was a joke, but it didn't hit as well. I guess you really are getting that old. Um, uh, (laughs) but, But there's something about being a part of it organically, going to conferences and seeing those folks, recognizing their faces, them asking about you, right? David needs that, Sam needs that, your clergy need that. And so this provides organic accountability and structure for your clergy. We'll go to our next one. I think this is our, oh, I got one more before FAQs. Um, Another thing is, and this probably impacts Due West a little bit less because I know the missional heart of this church, but being a part of denomination allows for long-term meaningful missional partnerships. I talked earlier about conferences working together, right? Um, Again, I, I know the heart of Due West, so I know that you are active and involved in ministry both here in the community and across the world. Um, But being a part of a denomination just opens you up to even more opportunities, Uh, even more places where you can go and be an impact in the community and the world. Um, It it opens you up, and again, we'll talk about global missions, to organizations you may never have heard of uh, and provides you the opportunity to to change lives that you never would have been able to change before. Um, Again, I think we're to our FAQs at this point. Um, So this is the, the, what I tried to do here was answer Three questions that I get most often from folks if I go and speak at a church or if they're just asking me in um, just regular conversation. The uh, first one is, is the Global Methodist Church just UMC 2.0? And again, I, I'm not speaking ill of any former tradition, um, but that's a legitimate concern for folks, right? Because you just voted to disaffiliate. If the GMC is just the UMC 2.0, why get involved with it, Right? And if that's your question, I think it's a very valid question. Uh, And again, it's one that that our church had to work through, and it's a question that many churches are working through. Um, But I can stand here and and say with a straight face that I genuinely don't believe, and I'll go through the reasons why that is not the case, Uh, why the Global Methodist Church is structured differently to not allow it to become the UMC 2.0. What I also say is this, though. um, Anytime you get with an organization, it's run by humans, Right, And so you can't predict everything that's going to happen. It's why that last one is so important for me. Right, There's no trust clause in the Global Methodist Church because there may come a day um, when things go awire. Uh, and, and by joining, you still have the ability to leave if you ever thought so. Um, but, but I'm not concerned about that for, for these reasons here. Um, so the first is global missions, and, and I brought this up. Um, global Missions in, in the Global Methodist Church are done drastically different than global missions in the United Methodist Church. Uh, if you were familiar with how that worked in our former tradition, there was a board, an agency of the denomination called Global Ministries that kind of oversaw the global mission work. And so it was a central hub where apportionment dollars went to global ministries, and then global ministries kind of divvied that out. A lot of that went to support some of the annual conferences across the world. It went to various mission organizations. Uh, the hub of that is actually in Atlanta. If you go to, I forget the name of the church down in Atlanta, Grace on Ponce, um, you'll see the big the building that they built kind of onto the back of that church. Um, there, there was a lot of red tape and a lot of bureaucracy, right? And, and really, in some ways, a middleman. And so the Global Methodist Church, what they've said is, we're not creating a global missions board. Uh, we're not creating an organization that uh, receives missions dollars, kind of decides what's important, and then sends that out. They've radically changed the way that we're going to do missions. So the way the Global Methodist Church is doing that is they're saying, we're going to approve vetted organizations. And there's a process for a mission organization. There's a website that they can go. They can apply. They have to submit their uh, governing documents. They have to submit uh, several years' financials. Um, and, and that is then vetted by the Transitional Leadership Council before they are then approved as a Global Methodist Church mission partner. Um, and the thought process behind that is, well, then local churches like Due West can go and see, we, we really feel called to serve in Guatemala, right? 
And so you can go then to the Global Methodist Church Mission Partnership page and see, are there any organizations that are working in Guatemala that align with our missional values that we know are properly vetted and and are using the resources responsibly, and then the church can decide to partner with them. Um, Apportionment dollars or connectional funding, as it's called in the Global Methodist Church, it it doesn't decide for you where your mission dollars are going to be going. That's, again, given back to the local church as the center of decision-making. And so that's a big reason, right? That, that institutional uh, fluff or bloating, um, reasons like global missions, makes me believe it won't be UMC 2.0. Another one is term limits for bishops. Um, there are bishops in the Global Methodist Church. Um, bishops being a biblical term. Uh, I, I encourage always folks, don't be afraid of that term bishops. Be afraid of non-term limit bishops, right? So term limits on bishops is part of that accountability which says, hey, we, we need to have people that are in these positions of authority, um, but we also need them to be accountable to the people that they're overseeing. And the way you do that is by returning them back to the places where they started. Um, so a bishop's much less likely to do something to anger their clergy if they know that they're going to be a clergy person at another point in time serving in a local church, right? The, the bishops are going to be less likely to do something to upset churches when they realize, well, I will be serving churches here not very long. And so that's a commitment of the Global Methodist Church. The, lim- the, the, the term has not yet been set. That is going to be set at the first general conference in uh, September. But the wording in there for term limits is already in the Book of Discipline. And so um, term limits for bishops is, again, another reason why I believe that the GMC won't become UMC 2.0. Uh, tangential to that, accountability to laity in churches at all levels. Um, One of the reasons we got ourselves in trouble, and this can go back to bishops, but it's not true for just bishops. Um, In our former tradition, there wasn't accountability between the bishops and anyone else. Bishops were accountable to bishops, right? And so when you're accountable to your fellow clergy and your your fellow um, kind of, for lack of a better word, same level folks, there's less accountability there. And so bishops will be elected by the general conference to serve in annual conferences And so those general conferences can come, and if there is a reason to believe that a bishop is doing something improper, uh, there's mechanisms within the Book of Discipline that they can vote to hold those bishops accountable. Um, So they have those structures in place to, again, because we're dealing with people, bad actors happen, right? And and so you don't want to design a system assuming there's no bad actors. Uh, You want to assume a system that can hold those accountable when they need to be. And so they're accountable because there's representation at every conference, right, then they are now accountable to laity and clergy at every level. You are represented by not just your clergy person, but your lay person at annual conference, and then potentially at general conference if they are elected. And so there is local accountability at every level. Another important thing here is no guaranteed appointment. Um, that's, that's big, in my opinion, um, because what that means is clergy will be held accountable for the fruit of their ministry. Um, that doesn't mean, right, that if the first year or so that, you know, maybe a, a clergy person has a decline in attendance, that all of a sudden they're fired and their credentials are taken away. But what it does mean is that churches themselves will be able to hold their clergy people accountable. And you do that through the hiring process, right? And so when a clergy person is not guaranteed a position, It means that someone who's not effective in ministry may go seasons without having a ministry position. Um, The way that you guarantee having a ministry position is maintaining effectiveness and uh, being involved in your church and all of these important things. And so when you take away that guaranteed appointment, it's scary, sure, as a clergy person, uh, but it also provides that accountability that I think churches deserve. Um, There's almost no other job in the world Uh, where you you can have consistently poor results and still maintain your job. Um, We would expect that in no other sector, um, but we have come up to to have that be a part of a church. So uh, there are no guaranteed appointments in the GMC, and I believe that will make more effective pastors as well. Um, Another reason that I'm optimistic and I believe in the future of the Global Methodist Church is these next two are kind of together. Smaller district sizes, which leads leads to organic connectionalism. That may sound counterintuitive to say that smaller districts and therefore more districts leads to less bureaucracy, but I believe it to be true. 
And the reason for this is, in our former tradition, and, and maybe David would agree with this, I don't know, we were a part of districts that were upwards of 130 churches at a time, which meant at, at the least you had 130 pastors, but many of those had associates and other clergy, so you had potentially 150, 160 people that we as clergy were supposed to be in relationship with. That, that's just impossible. Um, I think studies show that the best you can do is maintain around 200 relationships. That's about what the brain can maintain. So it's impossible and it's unfair for us to assume that clergy people can be in genuine connection with districts as large as we had them. And so the goal of the Global Methodist Church is to shrink that down and say, we actually believe that this connectionalism stuff is important. And so we're going to have districts of no more than 20 to 25 or so, uh, so that there is that organic connectionalism. Uh, I can speak to my own experience in Bartow County. Um, we have started, not under the directive of any district superintendent or presiding elder, as they're known in the Global Methodist Church, uh, we, we've started meeting regularly about once a month uh, as pastors. We'll uh, either meet at a church or, or go get breakfast somewhere. Uh, and we're doing that because we're in a district together. Uh, we're committed to this connectionalism, and it kind of just bubbled up out of nowhere. That's, that's what we want. And that's possible when you know the people in your district. It, it's impossible when there's 130 people and you've got counties in your district that are two and a half hours away. Uh, you, you can't have connectionalism. And so when your structure doesn't allow it, you can't say it's important. So we're saying it's important, and we want folks to be a part of one another's lives. And then lastly, I think I hit on that no trust clause. Uh, again, a huge part of ensuring that it doesn't become the UMC 2.0 is allowing the people the ability to leave. Um, none of this is, uh, none of the goal of the Global Methodist Church is to hold anything against a local church. Um, if you decide that the Global Methodist Church is not for you, you have the ability to leave. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to you know, go through any legal battles. You simply do a 30-day, or no, I think it's a 90-day discernment period. And if after 90 days the church votes and a majority of folks want to leave, well, then you can leave. And just like, in my opinion, no guaranteed appointments keeps people accountable, the ability for churches to leave keeps conferences accountable, right? That's a huge way for folks to keep their heads straight when they know that there are consequences to doing things that churches don't want. And there's many other reasons. But for me, these are the ones that convinced me the most that the Global Methodist Church is not going to be UMC 2.0, um, that it is charted to be its own expression of Wesleyanism in our world. Let's go to our, our next question, please. Uh, a great question is, how are apportionments handled in the Global Methodist Church? Um, you should be asking that question, and I hope you are. Uh, first, what I always say is, the GMC has changed the language of apportionments as you know them. What you know as apportionments are is the general church meets every four years and sets a budget. And so then what they do is they then apportion, that's where the word apportionments comes from, they apportion a percentage of that to each conference, right? And so then each conference comes and they make their budget. And they say, okay, it's going to cost us this amount to run our conference. And then we've got these apportionments that have come from the general church. So they set the budget. And then what they do is they look at each church. And there's a formula based upon membership and attendance and all of these things. And then they say, okay, well, then we're going to now apportion a percentage of this budget to the local church. Which is drastically different than saying we're going to have connectional funding. Which means we're going to ask every church to pay a percentage of their operating income. It's not based upon what the conference needs, it's based upon what the church receives. And there's no formula, meaning the church, the, the general conference doesn't give you, now they do give you guidelines to help you calculate it, but there's nobody that's gonna come in and audit the books and say, well, you missed $50 here, or you missed $100 here. The, the conference empowers the churches to say, here's, here's a guide if you want to use it, but you calculate what your operating expenses are, operating income, excuse me, your operating income is, and you're able to exclude things like capital expenses, you're able to exclude things like pass-throughs, right? So if you do an offering for $20,000 to go to Must Ministries, you don't have to include that as your operating income. What does it cost to operate the church? And as it currently states, you're asked to give 1% of that to the general church and 1% of that 
to the annual conference. So 2% of operating income is what is currently being asked of global Methodist churches. I can tell you, uh, it's been a minute since I have looked at Due West's financials, so I can't speak to those exact numbers anymore. I can tell you from Sam Jones's perspective, I believe the last year that we were in the United Methodist Church, our apportionments were almost $100,000, maybe just slightly under, uh, in this new formula that we calculated for this coming year. It's 24000 total, uh, 12 to the annual conference and 12 to uh, the general conference. Um, that's just uh, our calculations, and, and I think I was a part of that, so the numbers might be slightly off. But uh, it, it gives you a little bit of a picture of what that is. Now, there are provisions within the book of discipline that say there is a cap for what those percentages can be set at. The caps on those are 1.5% to the annual conference and 5% to the general conference. And I may actually have those, I think it's 5% to the annual conference and 1.5% to the general conference. Um, The beauty of that though is that that has to be voted on and approved by an annual conference and a general conference. And so they're currently set at 1% to both and it would require a vote of representatives from local churches and clergy to change that percentage. But that it, it can't go higher than the 5% or the 1.5%. So cap is 6.5%. And again, that's generally speaking much lower than what you would be used to. Um, generally in the United Methodist Church, because the formula shifted a little bit depending on the size, it was anywhere from 10 to, to 12% for most churches. Um, so, so that's how apportionments are calculated. Um, and if you have any questions on that, and again, it's not apportionments. I've got to even change my mind. That's how connectional funding uh, is, is calculated. I think I got one more uh, FAQ here. Uh, another question that folks ask, how are pastors deployed in the GMC? Right? What happens when we need a pastor? Or what happens when it comes time and we realize, uh, this is way after David's gone, right? Uh, but what happens when we come and we say, we don't think our pastor is being effective anymore. We think it's time to move into a new season. How does, how does that work in the Global Methodist Church? Um, so appointments work not on a yearly cycle. So what you're used to is every year, your SPR chair will stand up and say, we're so happy to announce that the bishop has appointed David and Sam to once again be our pastor for the next year. And then about 98% of you clap, and the other 2% go, oh, man, um, no, kidding, kidding. Um, right, so in the GMC, it, yeah, yeah, 2%, eh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, in the GMC, uh, appointments do not happen on a yearly cycle. Uh, they, they are not revisited every year. If a clergy person is happy and a church is happy, nobody comes and messes with things. Uh, the GMC believes that effective ministry happens when there's good relationships, right? Right. And churches and clergy know best when it's time to make that change. So you won't have your SPR chair standing up every year saying David's reappointed. Um, but what happens when it comes time to change, right? And whenever David eventually retires or uh, enters into a new season, same thing for Sam, right? Um, when a pastoral change happens, there's two ways that that can be initiated. The first is for the clergy person to say, I believe it's time to enter into a new season. I'm going to be the pastor at so-and-so church. Um, In many ways, you've got a little taste of it. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, When I went to be the pastor at Sam Jones, right? That that might would be an an analogous situation. There may come a time where Sam or David or somebody, whoever your pastor is, comes and says, I've received an opportunity. I feel really called to go and pursue this. And they initiate that and they move to a new appointment. Um, The other way to initiate that would be the church saying, we believe it's time for a new pastor, whether that's for reasons of, uh, you know, ineffectiveness, or sometimes it's not even ineffectiveness, right? It's simply, uh, we we need new leadership, it's time for a new season. And so through the SPR, the church can say, we would like to open our pulpit, we would like to search for a new pastor. So clergy and churches have a part to play. And then what happens in that moment is that is when the conference would get involved. But they would get involved in a helpful and advisory way. So they would say, we've got this pool of vetted pastors. Tell us what your needs are. Tell us what gifts you're looking for in a pastor. Tell us what your ideal pastor would look like. 
And they're able to take what you need, look at the vetted pool of clergy, and say, okay, we have these three candidates that we think would be excellent for Due West. Why don't you sit down and interview them and see what you think? And then the church is able to go through that process. It may be none of the three, or it may be two of the three, and you want to dig deeper. But ultimately, Due West would be able to go back to the bishop and say, we really like candidate X. We would like to hire them as the next senior pastor at Due West. The bishop would obviously consult with that pastor, and if the pastor wanted that and the church wanted that, the bishop would say, great, here's the appointment, and we set it now. Wouldn't have to wait until an annual conference. Those appointments would happen on a rolling basis. And so again, it does allow the church to be the main decision-making body and, and, and be a part of deciding and determining who your next pastor is. Um, they are appointed by the bishop, but only through consultation with the local church and in this sense, true consultation with the local church to determine who the best pastor for the church is. Um, it's drastically different um, than, than what you are uh, familiar with. I think the last slide here before we get into our questions and answers, uh, and I went a little long and I apologize for that. I, I want to read a quote for you. It's a, a meaningful quote for me. Uh, I think it perhaps distills why I think being a part of something larger than just a local church is drastically important for churches. Um, you've probably heard of John Wesley, of course, uh, but another famous early Methodist was George Whitfield. Most folks don't realize that George Whitfield was a part of that early Oxford Holy Club and was one of the first Methodists. Uh, him and Wesley eventually began to have some theological disagreements, um, but, but he was an, an early Methodist. And, uh, but but the, you know, the funny thing is, if, if you look back on history, People would tell you George Whitfield was a much better preacher than John Wesley was. Um, but you don't find any Whitfieldian Christians running around, right? We've got Wesleyans, we've got Methodists, but you don't find many Whitfieldians. Um, and, and I find that interesting with as good of a preacher as he is. And, and, and this was uh, something he remarked to a friend named Mr. John Poole. And I think it highlights one of the reasons why um, that might have been the case. So he was talking with, with Mr. John Poole, and, and he comes up to him and asks him, Well, John, are thou still a Wesleyan? Again, this was hundreds of years ago. Are thou still a Wesleyan? And Poole replied to him, Yes, sir. And I thank God that I have the privilege of being in connection with him and one of his preachers. And then John replied to him. He said, John, said Whitfield, thou art in the right place. My brother Wesley acted wisely. The souls that were awakened under his ministry he joined together and thus preserved the fruits of his labor. This I neglected, and my people are a rope of sand. Uh, there's something to being connected with one another. Uh, it was true in the time of Whitfield and Wesley, and I really do believe it's true today, uh, that we were called to go in this faith together. It's why God has raised up individual churches and why I think it's important to be a part of a denomination. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here, and uh, I don't know how we want to do the question and answer, but uh, my time is yours, and I'm happy to answer anything you, you have. Uh, any questions? And it's being recorded as David's walking. Just a reminder, we would ask that you ask them into the microphone so that those who watch this later... Right. Uh, how are Butch. you, Butch? Good to see Use you. the mic. Tell, tell everybody who you are, Butch. Uh, I'm Butch Goddad. I serve on the admin board here, and I had the dubious distinction of being our delegate to the conference when we had them in UMC. A short story about that, I was very impressed when the pastor asked me to do that. I have to admit, I wasn't all that humble. I said, gee, that's kind of neat that of all the people in the church, he asked me. And after the first conference in our little Thursday group, I, you know, small group, what we say there stays there generally, I looked at David and I said, what did I do to make you mad? <laughs> <laughs> But anyhow, uh, and one other short one is that uh, you had a great impact on me while you were Thank here. You. Thank you. Uh, you said something that I've never forgotten. I've shared with friends, and those that know me know I've embraced it because Latham said, why use 100 words when you can use 1,000? <laughs> <laughs> Wise but words. My question is this. You mentioned the Book of Discipline, and I've been out of touch with some of the goings-on. Uh, a while back, I knew there was a draft. Is that book complete? as a book of discipline, and as we're all aware that one of the issues that led to this divide is the, uh, the tendency for then bishops and others to ignore that book. So is the book really complete, ready to go, 
and what safeguards are there in place to make sure that the book is actually followed? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Uh, so right now in the Global Methodist Church, the Book of Discipline is called the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Disciplines. Uh, it is complete in its entirety. All of the necessary paragraphs have been written, uh, and you can find those on the Global Methodist website. If you ever want to go and peruse those, you're welcome to. Um, and, and so I use the term transitional, and I want to make that known. Um, it is as transitional as any book of discipline that Due West has ever been under. And what I mean by that is every time there is a general conference, the book of discipline is uh, opened back up, so to speak, in the sense of... so. The Book of Doctrines and Disciplines has been approved by the Transitional Leadership Council, which in this interim season as the denomination forms is kind of the, the top governing body of the church. Once that first convening general conference happens, that body will step away. The general conference assumes authority, and the term transitional is removed. So it is complete, though it is transitional. And there are safeguards that are in place to make sure that the discipline is being followed. Um, main, some of them I've brought up, right, because you have to, you have, to have it at every level. Um, and, and this was in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, though we didn't always follow it. Um, you can go and see that there are provisions and paragraphs that actually have it laid out. What happens if a person in the church begins to do something that's not in line with the values of the church? That's not something we often brought up in the United Methodist Church, but technically there is a process by which a church could say, we no longer feel that you are living by the standards that we as a church have adopted. Now, I'm not encouraging you to necessarily go through that, but there, there is a process, and there may be a time in the life of a church where that's necessary. Uh, other accountability measures I've mentioned, um, one for clergy themselves. Uh, there's that accountability to both the presiding elder and then to a bishop. Uh, there's also the accountability of a guaranteed appointment. Right In our former tradition, if you did something that wasn't necessarily against the rules but also wasn't in the rules, well, you might just get moved to another church, but you were required to have an appointment. In the Gold Methodist Church, clergy have to be held accountable to the book or else a church may just say, thank you for your services, we're going to find somebody else. Um, and then bishops are held accountable by the conferences themselves. And again, I, I don't have all of the language of what the percentage thresholds must be and how you bring it up. But at each conference level, a bishop can be brought up on charges, not by other bishops, but by lay people in the church, right? And so you, as a delegate to the annual conference, if you said, you know, I really think what this bishop has done is not in line with the book of discipline, there is a process in there, and I wish I knew the paragraph off the top of my hand, that you could initiate, and eventually the conference could vote to say, we think that this bishop is... Um, needs to be held accountable, uh, whether that is being removed from office or uh, other, some other sort of punishment. Um, but so, so those are in there. I, I hope that answers that question for you a little bit. Yeah. I took a thousand words to answer that just for you. First of all, I... Uh, I'm sorry. Bill Coffey. Oh, good to meet you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I retract what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> But nonetheless, I'll say it again. Um, we were truly blessed when you served here at Dewey. Ah, and I will say that um, we are blessed again to have you share your thoughts. My question relates to the convening general conference in September. Since we will be going through a discernment process of our own, uh, you could argue that there are benefits to waiting until the convening uh, conference ends and concludes any number of decisions. On the flip side, you could argue that joining the Global Methodist Church before the convening conference would give us an opportunity to participate. If you would share your thoughts about both sides, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, you laid it out pretty well. Um, and I see both arguments and think both are valid. So 100%, I agree with you, that Due West could make the decision to say, we want to wait and see what happens when the transitional is taken off. And what that allows you to do is, if you're fearful that something's going to get in there that doesn't align with the values that Due West holds, you get to see it. And it's laid out on paper for you, and you get to watch the process unfold. Um, 
I tend to be on the other side, but I'm not going to say that that isn't a valid opinion to take. And I think there's some wisdom to that opinion. Um, I love the idea of being a part of this at the ground floor. Um, I've gotten to see, you know, over the past 18 months, see it start with, I mean, I, I was one of the first clergy people in the Global Methodist Church in North Georgia. Um, whether that's good or bad, I'm not sure. But I, I mean, I was there when there was about four of us. And I've been able to be a part of this thing all along the way. Um, I've been able to, to, to see God take, take nothing and turn it into something. Uh, where there were no churches to now over 100. Uh, I've seen excitement in that. Um, it's been wonderful to see God at work. And so, yes, if Due West chose to join before the convening conference, uh, there's an opportunity for you to be a part of saying what the Global Methodist Church will be, right? Um, you will have a, a delegate at annual conference where we elect our representatives. You could potentially have you a representative, be elective of a representative, and have somebody at the seat at the table in San Jose, Costa Rica. It's exciting for me, um, but I, I am sympathetic to those that would prefer to wait, and I think that's an okay option too. Um, one thing to know is that some of how this is going to go is based upon timing. So I don't think this is non-public news, but it hasn't been broadcasted a ton. And uh, so cut the, cut the feed right now. I'm just kidding. Um, the annual conference for North Georgia is going to be May 3rd and 4th. Um, so my understanding would be, and this is not a pressure, so right, if this timeline doesn't fit with Due West, then it really answers the question for you. Um, our, my understanding is we're going to elect our delegates May 3rd and 4th. So to, to, be at, to be at the table, Due West would have needed to have joined by that time. Uh, the reason for that, obviously, is travel needs. Um, they are allocating delegates here soon, and so we'll know how many delegates we have. It's, there, there's a lot of moving pieces to that. Um, so I, I think you laid it out great. There's, there's two good options. It's really just um, time for Due West to decide what the best timeline is, um, and there's not a wrong answer there in my opinion. It's on television. I'm Chip Say. Oops, sorry. Chip Say. My wife and I joined this this past summer. So Wonderful. Great to meet you. Here. Here. Um, as a grandson of a former United Methodist preacher, I've I've had problems with the Book of Discipline for a long time, unrelated to what's going on. Sure. That caused the split. I'm just curious how the the GMC version of that came to be. Is it modeled? After the, I'm oversimplifying it, but sure. is it like, okay, let's take the UMC one and we like this, we don't like this, or did somebody just sit down and say, you know, these are our rules, these are what we believe in? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I could tell you all the inner workings of that. I, I don't know specifically. Uh, it, it was a, a collaborative process with several leaders, both those in the WCA and then those who ended up being a part of the Transitional Leadership Council. They were a key part of drafting that document. Their process, I, I'm not entirely sure. There are parts of it that are modeled after the Book of Discipline in the sense of if you read through it, you'll find, right, paragraph number this, subsection this. Uh, whether that's modeled after United Methodist Discipline or just many governing documents, I, I'm not sure. There are key parts of it, though, that are, that are different. One is just in length. Um, you know, you'll find a United Methodist Discipline David's got a great uh, collection of them if you ever want to go see all of them back to before John Wesley was around. Um, he, you know, the UMC one's this thick. Uh, you, you didn't know I was going to rib on you so much when you invited me, did you? Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the GMC one I think is less than 100 pages or, or maybe slightly under, um, right at 100 pages or so. Um, so it, it was an intentional decision to cut out some of that stuff that's just not necessary. Uh, what I love about the discipline is there's theological things that were left out of the discipline in the UMC that have been included intentionally in the GMC. I was a part of some of the conversations in 2016 when we sat around a table and said, do we want to include the Nicene Creed as a part of our book of discipline? Uh, and we voted no on that, surprisingly. Um, all of those things are listed as doctrinal key commitments in the Global Methodist Church. So I, I hope that answers it a little bit. It, it is similar in some respects, but I, I do believe it's different in a lot of other ones. 
Um, the Methodist Church started in 1784 in Baltimore. Yes. Uh, I have a 1790, my oldest discipline is 1798, so when the church was 14 oh, years wow. old. Wow. And I've got most of them since then. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you ever do want to, you just can't sleep and want to come take a look. Uh, <laughs> at 250 years of church disciplines, I got them. Right. And I love, as you're walking back there, I love that we went back to the old language. Um, yeah, yes. the, the book of doctrines and disciplines. That was the original name for it, and uh, eventually it became the book of discipline, but we've gone back to the old title. Uh, Latham, Sandy Dean. Uh, hey, just Sandy. A question. Uh, if the church stays independent um, in 15 years from now or any, whenever David retires, 15? Church, Oof. church is uh, looking. <laughs> you think he's uh, got 15? I'm just absolutely. Kidding. I think he's got 20. <laughs> But is, are the GMC vetted pastors, are they restricted to only uh, uh, serving uh, global Methodist churches? Are they, if you have an independent church, can an independent church reach out to, to uh, look at uh, GMC vetted pastors? I wish I had a definitive answer for you, but I can tell you, I can tell you some things. I think I can answer it mostly. Um, right now, certainly, there's been a lot of grace in allowing GMC pastors to serve in independent congregations. I did that for most of my time at Sam Jones, and we, we officially joined January 1st. So anything prior to that, I was a GMC elder serving in an independent congregation. There's been a lot of grace on that, especially as churches have tried to discern whether or not they're going to disaffiliate, and then once they do, who they're going to affiliate with. Um, some of that will need to be worked out as the GMC continues to form, I mean, there's some reason for the GMC to say, look, we would like for our pastors to serve GMC churches. The reason I don't think it will ever get to the point where it will be absolutely required, meaning that GMC pastors can't serve in non-GMC churches, is because of the fact that there's no guaranteed appointment. And so I would feel hard-pressed that there will ever be a system without guaranteed appointment where the conference could say, you can't serve another church. What would happen would be like... I was, and like David and Sam currently are, you would be a GMC pastor who's considered inactive, and all that inactivity means is that you're not eligible for Global Methodist Church health insurance. So if you were to serve a church outside of the GMC as a pastor, that church would then be obligated to help you find um, insurance, whether that was through the, the marketplace or through a uh, plan that the church sponsored. So um, I can't say with 100% definitive nature that, that I'm right on that, but that's generally what the consensus has been recently. Hey, Latham. Hey, hey. Ron Moore. Good to see you again. Uh, it's good to see you. My daughter, Cindy, wants me to tell you that she loves you. <laughs> well, tell, tell her, tell her I, and I'll send you a picture of it if you don't believe me. I have a picture that she colored hanging on my refrigerator. I believe it was of one of the Disney princesses. So we, we look at it every day. Uh, uh, that's not what I wanted to talk about. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question concerns what you addressed about pastors, about their tenures. Um, I understand the thoughts on the, the senior pastor uh, because, you know, they've been through a long, they've been around the block a few times like David. But part of, <laughs> part of David's development, I suspect, was him serving in different churches. Um, and, I, and I say that from my own experience as a leader in the Army. You know, we moved every three years, and we, we didn't like moving. Sure. But that experience of having new blood in that unit was really important. So um, from what I hear you saying, I think it's not so much important for the senior pastor, but for the associate pastors... And you're an exception because I told you when you were here, you're one of the best associate pastors I've ever seen. Thank you. Top drawer. Um, but so you're an exception to the rule. But I think young pastors, associates, that moving around is good for them to experience different congregations, to get new blood in a congregation. And, and I know it's nice to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, you get comfortable when you stay Absolutely. somewhere a long time. But sometimes you need to be uprooted and put in a, you know, have a new chapter in your life yeah. as a pastor or whatever. And, and it really helps, I think, the organization overall. Yeah, I agree. And, and what I would say to that is 
What I think the GMC provides the opportunity for is for that to not be pushed on folks, but for it to still happen. And so, right, if, if, if the church values that, if Due West values that, right, say we value having a new associate every four or five years, right? There's nothing that says Due West couldn't come up with a policy, an SPR policy that says, look, it's nothing personal, and, and if it comes down the line and we want to change this, we can, but we have the policy that every four years we change associates, right? You are hiring the associate, and so you would have the freedom to make that statement. Um, it also has the ability to uh, create other dynamics, right, where you might bring in an associate that says, we really think this person's great. We want to pour into this person and see them maybe transition down the line into the senior leadership role. Um, there's, I, I think you'll find that that movement will still be happening. Um, we see it in other denominations where there is more of a... Um, call method of appointing pastors, whether it's a Baptist church or Presbyterian church, there's going to be opportunities for associates that open up after three or four years where if they've been effective in ministry, churches are going to come calling them and say, look, we would love for you to come and be our associate or we want you to come and be our senior pastor. So I, I, I do a sense where you're saying of with the, the, the old appointment system, right, it was kind of forced and, and they'd be sent here, there and everywhere. Um, I think some of what you're talking about will still happen. It just may look a little different. Um, but I don't disagree with you that part of growing and learning is, I liked how you said it, sometimes we like being comfortable, but we don't always grow when we're comfortable. Uh, and I think that's true for us, and it's true for pastors too. I sure know. <laughs> Uh, could everybody that has a question on this side of the room kind of get together? <laughs> uh, Bob Ralph Latham. Uh, first, thanks for coming and sharing your experience thus far. Uh, my question's more around the structure you showed, and I know they were 40,000-foot uh, sure. uh, level slides. There's a lot more detail there. But um, uh, the autonomy that seems to exist at a local level with the churches um, any concerns while, when that was all being put together uh, as to 10, 15 years down the road, what that might look like? My concern would be inconsistencies uh, at a local level in terms of how churches behaved and how well they adopted and practiced uh, the, the methods. Sure. Um, I, I, I think the way to answer that is there is a lot more detail in the book. Um, and so there is a lot of autonomy, but at the same time, there is a lot of guidance that says, here's what it looks like to be a Wesleyan Methodist church in the global Methodist church. Um, meaning there is, like in the former book discipline, it says, hey, here's how you maintain an SPR committee. Here's what the makeup of that committee should look like. Uh, same for finance, trustees, admin board. All of those things are on there. Um, there's... Right, the theological commitments are all there. Um, so I, I do have a, I have less fear of that, though I don't, I guess, have the, the total answer to your question, and I think it's a valid one, that right, there's always inconsistencies across churches, and that's been true. Um, but where are those places where we can't allow inconsistencies? And I guess I'm just kind of talking out loud right now. Uh, I, I think those are codified. Um, it's a really bad answer to your question other than uh, from a 40,000 foot view I, I do think you, you miss some of the detail that is part of the book of discipline that is helpful uh, it's one of the reasons we joined the Global Methodist Church as Sam Jones was because it did provide us a much more detailed structure than we had while we were independent um, that doesn't mean you can't create one as an independent church um, but it did lay out for us, hey, here's what our governing structure is so that as we go out into the world and do things, we tried to open a CD one time when we were independent, and they said, well, who's this? What's this? And we go, uh, we'll get back to you on that, right? Um, that, that is a little bit more laid out. So that probably didn't answer it fully, but on, on the path to answering it, yeah. Um, Justo Gonzalez, who's a well-known theologian uh, out of Columbia Seminary, uh, in Atlanta, 
when he talks about doctrine, church doctrine, he says doctrine is the foul lines of the baseball field. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's not a straight line, but it tells you what's in play and what's out of play. And the goal is that you keep the ball in play. And that's what doctrine yeah, yeah. does. And that's what I do like about yeah. it, it is more theologically robust. I mean, including things like the Nicene Creed and so many other of these traditional kind of long-standing orthodox belief systems that say, and, and if you join, I mean, there's a, a certain level of local accountability where what you'll be saying is, we vote and affirm that we believe this and will follow it. Um, again, th- what does that look like 50 years from now? I mean, that, that, that is just a good question that um, hopefully I'll find out one day when I get there. I'm Beth Norton Fant. I'm the decorator and, and uh, part of the choir. <laughs> um, when we disaffiliated, I was a little concerned about what would happen with our paid staff, and um, I just wondered what are the benefits going global that will be helpful to them. Are you speaking specifically about like compensation benefits, or just uh, no, no, just what, what would be what. What would be helpful to them sure. if we voted for that? Sure. I can answer the benefits side of it first, and then I'll give you the kind of um, just the internal benefits as well. Um, so currently there is not through West Path a staff outside of clergy health insurance option. Uh, that is changing in July, I believe. Um, Global Methodist Church is changing benefits providers from West Path to Guidestone which is a benefits provider for 13 different denominations. And I believe, uh, if I read the the article correctly, at that point in time, there will be a health insurance benefits options for lay staff, not just clergy. Um, They also will have the opportunity, as they do now, to pay into a retirement account, and the church can give a percentage as well, and that would be monitored and and managed by Guidestone. Um, So that's the compensation benefits. There, There are some compensation benefits that would come with that, though the church could make all of those decisions independently and still do those things, right? So the church could still offer insurance to your staff. You could still offer retirement benefits to your staff that are independent from that. But it does give you a place to send it. Um, As far as benefits go, kind of these um, just, how does it help develop our staff? How does it make them better? Um, You know, some of that, I believe, comes through connection where, um, you know, you have this kind of built-in you know, if you're the youth director, you have local youth directors that, much like your clergy, you might meet regularly and talk about best practices and see what's working and hear good ideas and just love on one another because it, it is a difficult job. So you have that. You have opportunities um, not to call them out, but you've got a wonderful guy on staff, Mark Hellman, who is, I believe, serving in a capacity in the Global Methodist Church as the missions district liaison cool shirt guy. Um, that, that's, I think, the official title. Um, so there's opportunities, right, for, for, for the staff to um, be poured into in a leadership and given responsibilities um, over and above their responsibilities in the local church, um, which then allows folks to make more connections, right, to, to build missional partnerships, to go out and do better things in the community and here at the church. Mark will be a better director of missions because of this work, as well as he will support other churches too. So uh, you do get a little bit of that connection. That again, I don't want to say can't happen as an independent church. You just have to make it happen. You have to to be much more intentional about it, and you have to stay on it. Where in the GMC, it provides very natural places to go for that, where Mark's a part of this district, and they get together regularly for this work. So I, I think those are some of the benefits, and I'm sure there's others as well. Hi. Hello. Again, I'm Leela. My question is, um, if we vote to go global, we just have spent some time and effort developing things like our bylaws. Mm-hmm. Would those be in, is, would those be incorporated? Does the Global Methodist have its own set of bylaws, and ours are kind of they're going to be very similar because we we did ours very Wesleyan like. Sure. Sure. But 
does the global Methodist have its own bylaws so that we would incorporate those? and not use ours? So this is one, I don't know the fullness of the answer because I'm not a lawyer and don't ever give legal advice. Um, I would say that you don't have to, if you were to join the Global Methodist Church, you could go on, join with no bylaws and, and you now have everything you need to be a fully functioning governed organization. Um, without having seen the bylaws, I, I don't know, my assumption would be is that anything in the book of doctrines and disciplines would kind of supersede any local bylaws, again, I don't know that those would be in contradiction, um, and it doesn't mean you couldn't hold those and say, look, we want to expand on a few places. Um, I, if you really have that question and, and want to dive into it further, I know somebody that does this sort of, he, he's a lawyer and has helped with a lot of the legal things, Dan Parr is his name, uh, he may have been, you, you, y'all may know his name, um, he might would be better able to answer what that is, yeah, yeah, sounds like you know him, okay, all right, okay, y'all got to know him, I'm sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Dan is famous now. Yeah. Yes, across the, across the globe almost. Yeah, he actually came one day last fall and, and talked about oh, good. Okay. distillation, so he's, he's been, dude, right where you are. Yeah. and Hilbig, Hello. One of the members of the congregation. I had a question in regards to the bishop, the bishops, how they were appointed. Uh, understand long-term won't happen, but how is that process that's happened and in the future? Yeah, so the way uh, it's currently set up is that bishops will be elected at the general conference, but they will go and serve in the places that they have served which I think is a huge uh, benefit, and I, I hope this is answering your question. So uh, we'll use David as an example, right? If um, it, the, the spirit moved and uh, we needed a bishop in North Georgia and uh, a, a groundswell happened, David, if he were to be a bishop, would be elected at the General Conference to serve in North Georgia. Um, now, this is also one of those areas that uh, there is growing movement behind returning to an older method of bishop deployment where bishops aren't resident bishops. And so what I mean by that is bishops would not be local to one particular annual conference. This is how it was at the very beginning of Methodism, where bishops worked with multiple conferences and were less administrators and were more missional partners, teachers, theologians. So your bishop wouldn't be in your area all the time. They would be there for annual conference. They would be there for important events. They would lead the strategic vision of the conference. They would be the leading theologian in your conference. But they wouldn't be the administrator of the conference. And I actually think it's an interesting way to look at the position because I think that's more of a return to a biblical understanding of what a bishop could be. Um, but... I think that maybe answered your question. That's, that's still one of those, though, that uh, a transitional, um, there, that the general conference will need to decide is, is how exactly, what number of bishops do we want? And I I've, I've tend to kind of be convinced that the idea of non-residential bishops is, is a good thing. Anybody else? Don't forget, I have a mic on. All right. Well, Lathan, we appreciate you coming. Yeah, thank you so much. If you don't mind, um, I would love to pray for Due West, if that is That'd all right, awesome. if that thank would you, close our time. Uh, let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, Lord, I'm so thankful for the folks in this room. Uh, Lord, for their love for one another and their love for you. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for the impact that they have had on my life, uh, on my family's life, on my wife's life, and, and even my daughter's life. Uh, Lord, for all the ways that I look at them and see you, I just give you thanks. And so, God, I ask that you be with this congregation over the next few months. Uh, Lord, help them to discern your will for what it looks like to, to be a part of your church here at Due West. Lord, you have guided this congregation for 50-plus years, and I have no doubt that you will continue to guide it until you return once more. Lord, help them to know what is best. Help them to seek after you first and foremost. And Lord, whatever decision they make, 
may you be at the center of it. May Jesus Christ and the cross be there so that when folks come into this building, they might know the love of God in a way they have never experienced it before. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you.